Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully you're getting settled in. Uh, Mark, if you could advance to the next slide. Thank you so much. So as a reminder, we are recording this webinar. I'm Jill Hunger and I'm the assistant director of the Department of Community Planning, Housing and, Dire and Development, as well as one of the co-leads for the Commercial Market Resiliency Initiative. Thank you for being here with us this afternoon. This afternoon's webinar will begin with a presentation by Mark McCauley, Director of Real Estate Development Group in Arlington Economic Development, and the other co-lead for the Commercial Market Resiliency Initiative. We are all here this afternoon to learn about adopter fee use, answer your questions, and obtain feedback. Before we get started, I wanted to explain how this afternoon will work. The presentation will be followed by a Q&A se session. You will find a Q&A button at the top of your screen. Click on that, and you'll be able to type in your questions, and please do so throughout the presentation. You may have more of a comment or observation that you wish to share, and we welcome that as well. We do ask you that you use the same respectful tone in the Q&A that you would while speaking. I will be posing your questions to Mr. McCulley at the end of his presentation, but please note that several of you may have similar questions or comments, and for timekeeping purposes, we may group these topics together. For those of you have, that have called in this afternoon and have a question that has not been answered, we would ask you to submit a question or comments online or through email after the webinar. Now, now I will turn it over to Mark for his presentation. Great, thank you very much, Jill. And thank you very much, Jill, and welcome all. Uh, as Jill said, today we'll be spending uh, a lunch and learn, the first of two lunch and learns, looking at Arlington's office supply challenges in particular, uh, concepts such as adaptive reuse and building repositioning. The goal today is to inform and educate what trends we're seeing that are impacting Arlington's uh, office market as well as its fiscal health and discuss some initial concepts uh, and to uh, get some questions and some clarifying uh, responses as well as some initial feedback. So what are the trends we're seeing in the in the Arlington market that's that's driving a, a big part of this discussion? Well, clearly we've seen uh, major structural uh, changes in how our office market operates, both the local context and the regional context, um, and how we think about that impacting our fiscal health of our community. And so we'll hear the word structural a lot today, um, this is not a cyclical nature in our opinion and in many opinion in the opinion of many others. Uh, we look at uh, significant headwinds uh, over the past decade uh, that are persisting, uh, things like continued changes in utilization rates and in the federal footprint. That the that that despite an Amazon uh blip and 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 an improvement with Amazon coming in um that we saw some leasing activity and and interest in older buildings but obviously the pandemic and the post pandemic experience have looked at concerns about RTO return to office uh office leasing and now a significant capital market challenge so what is the new reality that we're looking at once again, we feel these are structural changes, and this requires a significant intervention uh, by all involved, including the local government, to really reposition and restructure our office market. Um, the office oversupply is really the albatross across the over the neck of the office market and office market valuation, and that a large supply of obsolete office space is really hindering the market's ability to restructure, and that is the topic of this conversation. Second is we want to uh, continue to be uh, uh, provide a sense of urgency uh, and, uh, and 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 continue to to help under, help folks understand and help ourselves understand that that the worst may be ahead that we have lagging fundamentals uh, particularly in our assessments that this is a longer term issue um, and that therefore the policy action is really about one stabilizing our fiscal uh, health in our office market, as well as looking at um, uh, policies and tools for incremental recovery. 
So some just basic data that we're looking at um, uh, that tells uh, a big part of the story. If you look at the past 10 years relative to um, where uh, office value stood, a percentage of our total real estate assessments in the county in 2014, we're at 22%. We're down now to 14%. When we talk about the 50-50 fiscal balance in the county, uh, we often remind folks that the commercial part of that uh, is uh, includes commercial apartments, which have really um, have really stabilized uh, uh, that part of our fiscal base, although it's still not 50 50. It's, it's now about 45 50 55. Um, and we cannot therefore continue to shed this uh, core uh, part of our fiscal base, which is our office market sector as office values uh, continue to decline. And one, just as a sort of food for thought, as we think about what this means and over the past 10 years looking back, um, if we had had the same office valuation today as we did in 2014, over the past 10 years, the county would have received over 67, almost 68 million in additional tax revenue over that time. Uh, if that office sector had grown by two and a half percent annually over that time, instead of its decline, we would have generated over $310 million. All obviously important impact on services, infrastructure, and schools. And so what happens when, when we think about what happens to assets um, and how are we reacting to those, those market, um, market changes? Well, one, when we see uh, significant structural distress like this, we often see initial uh, and a large part of our sector that's good, that's that's really racing to the bottom and providing um, desperate lease terms to try to fill va a vacant office space in a, a low demand environment where the buildings don't have uh, a tr significant value play and therefore competing with commodity products throughout the region. And we're seeing these properties even when having some lease success, valuation dropping up to 40 to 70 percent. Um, and uh, you know, continuing to to reach levels of distress, uh, we often see. We also see, as we've talked about, uh, and many in this call know, a flight to quality, where well-positioned buildings are able to capture tenant demand, often at no new net gain of lease lease space in the county, but as uh, tenants seek to, to seek to acquire higher quality leases uh, um, in newer buildings with amenities, and. What does that mean when we when when we're thinking about what the choices are for a property owner? Um, many uh, have been placed in the survive or, or or mechanism of of trying to really sort of just compete on sort of commodity leases, but that's only a limited uh, and and um, a temporary option. Often, as we've seen, sort of leading to significant uh, threats of default throughout the throughout the inventory. So there are really three options of change and that we'll deal with in terms of what the county's response is. Repositioning, which is investing in office buildings uh, to improve their quality. Adaptive reuse, which is the change of use of a building to an alternative use with minimal changes to building structure and redevelopment. And all of which have their own challenges and processes we'll talk about. So, this is part of a broader effort that we've undertaken with the county as part of commercial market resiliency to look at how we uh, intervene into our office market. Uh, one is addressing office demand. Uh, two is working on placemaking and collaboration with our partners. And the third in the middle highlighted here is the subject of this lunch and learn in our efforts this fall, which is rethinking office supply through a number of these tools through which we can remove obsolete office buildings from the inventory and recycle them as uh, more fiscally positive assets. So we've intentionally decided to lead this process with the adaptive reuse uh, and building repositioning and particularly adaptive reuse as a first uh, level of how we can change our policies and practices and regulatory structure to assist the the transformation of our office and inventory. Uh, one, we identified this as having the most defined process gap. And what I mean by that is 
um, the, the most disconnect between what the process is today for doing an adaptive reuse project and what the process could be uh, in a more streamlined approach and including uh, looking at other jurisdictions and what they've accomplished. And we've also, uh, which we hadn't had for several years, now have a lot of specific, very specific interest in adaptive reuse projects um, that are waiting for uh, our process to catch up so that projects can go through due diligence and financing. So the time is of the essence to get this done uh, this year, this fall. Um, certainly reducing the time and money of investments is a core part of our work uh, uh, on how we can reduce the processes, uh, time and uncertainty. Um, and then we will talk a little bit of redevelopment uh, as part of a broader policy discussion, but I really want to make clear that some of those are more complicated and nuanced. We understand the redevelopment process is an important tool being used and an important tool to continue to be discussed and how that can be thought. Uh, but much of this policy guidance this fall will look at uh, teeing up further conversation on that. So again, adaptive reuse when the principal use, uh, but minimal changes to building form uh, and the community and benefit uh, community benefit assets are maintained, repositioning where the primary use change stays the same, and there's but there are substantial upgrades to the buildings and redevelopment. Uh, which is where there's more typical uh, teardowns or partial teardowns of a building uh, and uh, full on redevelopment. So what's the value proposition of of this policy action? Um, certainly the benefits of the county and the relatively little impact that we think these types of adaptive use projects could have, meaning the building form isn't changing, the height isn't changing. Uh, just the use, uh, the general placement of the building and form isn't changing. Uh, and we do think the benefits are significant in terms of speed to market, uh, as well as speed to fiscal stabilization recovery, as these projects are able to deliver faster, have a clearer investment path, get to highest and best use faster, deliver uh, just below sort of top end of the market, market rate values for, for new uses in the building. Um, and so that does two things. It provides significant fiscal increase as well as providing a another layer of, say, in housing's case, another layer of housing value or housing positioning that the market uh, can continue to benefit from. And as well as we'll talk about uh, at length over the over the fall is whether there's new and innovative uses that could uh, be spurred by this um, push to reuse buildings. So the definition uh, that we're working that we are, is our working definition uh, is is the adaptive reuse is a change in the primary use of a building focused on internal construction with minimal change to the building exterior or site and nominal changes in density. We look to uh, address this in a policy with specific guidance and some ordinance and regulatory changes this fall and winter of this year, but certainly for this year. What are the current barriers to adaptive reuse? Well, when we're looking at um, the first one being the change in use itself under current ordinance, uh, uh, most site plans that have a primary use to change that, it's a major site plan amendment if it's over a certain relatively low hurdle of change in use. So a full building change in use, say from office to residential, office to hotel, um, uh, for the most part, almost always require a major site plan amendment to deal with that change in use. That is a timely and often costly uh, and at times uncertain for some investor circles um, process, and we think that's a hurdle. Um, two, that many sector plans, our long-term plans, have over, over time sort of looked at use of a particular site or building as, an, as a long-term vision. Uh, we have history of looking at this with the admin guidance of 2020 and want to continue that conversation of whether things like defined uses and long-term plans are really where the market uh, is going for the next 20 or 30 years, given some structural changes or where, whether more flexibility is needed to allow for a new reality where buildings are, <clears throat> are being used much differently than they were in the past. And then what I know we'll have a lot of conversation with not only today, but moving forward is uh, looking at existing site plan conditions. Many of you in the building industry are, are, uh, are your, are your, are your, are your 
vendors are uh, look at these and look at site plan conditions that are often challenging to change. Uh, they were they were written for a very particular purpose. They trigger a lot of potentially process. Um, and how do we begin to create processes around streamlining that approach? And then two is what site plan conditions are applied to a new project, an adaptive use project that may want to uh, uh, introduce the newest standards, but often a adaptive reuse may not be as able financially or physically to accommodate those new standards. So what needs to change in terms of our, you know, uh, as we think about our considerations, certainly I think a big part of this community conversation is about embracing risk and embracing risk in the, in the, in the, in the context of urgency and appropriate level of urgency. And looking at streamlined processes as an important step, maybe a different step than we've taken in the past, but an important step to really uh, managing this crisis in the most effective way. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, a transparent and thoughtful conversation about long term policies and visions, some of which may don't reflect the reality of massive significance shifts structurally and just how we live as 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 people and how we interact with buildings that happened over the past 10 years, in particular during the pandemic and afterwards. Second, what is success? We think fiscal stabilization is first, uh, really getting sort of our feet underneath us and then looking at recovery. Uh, as I said, innovative use of buildings uh, and the maintenance and and uh, of dynamic urban places and placemaking. What are the risks? Um, certainly the change in known level of review, uh, uh, looking at trans transformational change and maybe forgoing that, and then market resistance are some of those. So quickly, and we'll have more uh, time for Q&A, um, what are some of the streamlined paths? Certainly a broad eligibility for applicable projects, uh, a greater swath of the amendments that could be approved as part of an administrative or hybrid process, clarifying the, the intent of and the upper limits, limits of density um, and the cost of that, and what are the submittal requirements to get an application in? Uh, what is being considered in terms of uh, review and of standards being applied? And then time, I think we we have a we have a certainly a focused effort of making a streamlined process uh, that obviously is streamlined and that does change how we think about the time of uh, an idea coming to the county or a concept coming to the county and being able to achieve uh, the appropriate permits to start construction. In this case, Dr. Rio is mostly interior construction. Uh, and we've, we're really looking at a number of different options. One is if there's a tiered approach where maybe we uh, clear the hurdle of use change and continue to look at things like density and changes to the site and building at various levels of review, but to give um, uh, the owner some sense of, 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 of of incremental change in the entitlements, and we want to hear whether that's an appropriate or valuable path. And then if there are more significant changes, maybe we look at more of a hybrid model between admin, minor, minor uh, uh, tweaked or minor amendments as is. And then finally, as we're, as we're looking at concepts that do significantly change the building form, do really address changes in community benefits, uh, we would still uh, certainly in the outset sort of expect those to continue to be major policy discussions, major amendments that go through a typical review process. So the expected scale, we don't expect that many of these, though I think the opportunity is great. So while there may not be a number a lot, we do think the opportunity is a strong one. We, many of you can tell us as well as we can tell you, but uh, there are limits to the types of buildings that can achieve conversions, uh, both in terms of the physical and financial characteristics of those buildings. So we're excited about um, the number that we may see, but it's not going to be an overwhelming tidal wave of activity. It's going to be more, to me, to us more of a meaningful and impactful, uh, but obviously manageable process. And why did we start the policy approach? Uh, we had RTA'd something in, in April, as many of you may know, uh, and we're going to move forward with some sort of right to sort of some maybe some zoning text amendments this fall. Uh, as we went through the process, we realized a board approved policy that dealt with a broad swath of issues uh, was important to setting the stage for future uh, ordinance and regulatory changes. 
Uh, it could provide the the urgency. It could identify those swath of changes. It could look at the particular policy guidelines and identify areas for further discussion um, and offer clarity on implementation, all of which a policy can do, which individual actions uh, often don't have the uh, context to do. So a uh, part of these additional policy responses, we will be dealing in policy form with building repositioning and hope to get to that end of this year in terms of potentially some changes to our policies, uh, but also our ordinances and regulatory processes. Uh, redevelopment, I think we'll have much more tee up conversations this year into next um, about a wide variety of ways we think of a redevelopment uh, and how we may stream on that process. But I want to be very clear that that's about teeing up those conversations because those are much more significant community conversations to have. Uh, we already do a significant amount of what we call switches or what's called switches in the, in the real estate community, which is changing pre-construction um, uh, a use. Uh, and that will continue. I think the one change may be taking the admin guidance and making it a board policy document. And then finally, incentives have been raised. We are looking at incentives, uh, not a priority over process and pol uh, this year, uh, but is running concurrently. And we'll be looking at that uh, into next year of, of both what others have done and what the appropriate role of incentives, financial incentives are for the county. So the timeline is we do intend to come to the board in September with an RTA for a policy, uh, go through the various commissions and committees, as well as other stakeholder groups. Uh, we do want to have a second lunch and learn in September and a board uh, a date to be determined that gives more detail on where we are relative to that RTA, uh, and then go to the county board with a approval or consideration of a policy in October. Uh, hopefully October, uh, maybe November, but we're certainly serving for October in the interest of time. And then the associated changes to ordinance, other things that kind of need county board approval, as well as admin behind the scenes work will be happening concurrently. And we hope to um, continue to work on those this fall in a similar time schedule. Um, building repositioning, as I said, will be more of sort of end of this year into next as we as we test some of those concepts out and then redevelopment 2025 and beyond. So uh, with that said, I will now hand it back off to Jill. Uh, we will do want to get questions and clarifying questions. I know that was a lot of material uh, in a short period of time. Uh, we have a lot more to say if people want to have clarifying questions. Also would like, as Jill said, to use, you, to use the Q&A function to provide distinct feedback or things that we need to think about further. Uh, and this won't be the only way that you can communicate with us. We'll talk about that at the end of the meeting as well. But back to you, Joe. Sure, great. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for that presentation. I, I think first and foremost, uh, there is a question that came up um, of maybe if you could go back to slide 12. I think that's where you had a definition for adaptive reuse. It'll allow some folks some time to, to really review it and perhaps copy uh, of what you're you're looking at. Um, additionally, at the top of the Q&A, there is information and a link to the main web page, and we will be posting uh, all of this information and the slide deck on there as well. So thank you, Mark. I'm going to move over. Um, and, and I, I think this is you know, going a little bit into a, a deeper dive. I'm not certain if you are able to speak to it, uh, but I think you had some slides. Slide seven um, spoke to sort of evaluation, what was going on with our office buildings. There we go. And I know this is looking at office and, and what was going on. And I, I guess the question is, is looking at um, Revenue streams come from a variety of different sources, and have you been able to also compare this to what's going on with the rest of the revenue? Um, sort of that shift of, of our, our residential um, and other categories. Yeah, as, as many know that follow the budget, our, our revenues to the county, uh, leaving aside things like state, federal and state support, uh, come from a relatively limited number of sources, property assessments and property tax, real property taxes being the largest. So we tend to focus on that the most. Um, 
we've seen, and I and I I don't know exactly where you're going, Jill, but we've seen obviously um, a long-held uh, view of Arlington being one of the few jurisdictions um, in suburban sort of DC, and really, and quite frankly, in many places across the nation, that really had a sort of 50-50 balance where our commercial sector was generating revenue related to uh, uh, its own presence and growth, uh, the same as residential, and that provided significant benefits to the county, including providing the high level of services to our residents because the commercial sector was helping to pay for it. Um, uh, that balance has been, as, as, as I mentioned, has been challenged by the continued decline. And as I want to stress, the continued decline will continue um, uh, into the future um, and will and, and 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 the office sector while uh, really providing a buttress against that over the past 10 years can continue to fill that gap if we continue to decline. There's only so much amount of of, of revenue that can come from new construction and, and, re and rental and growth in the rental apartment valuation. Uh, there's only a finite amount of demand and finite demand ability to add new inventory. In that in that space, so um, we're really reaching what we what we call sort of an urgency here, a crisis moment of um, of the apartment sector has 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 been able to hide some of this uh, for a little bit while we knew it was happening, but that's uh, sort of time is sort of continuing to come to an end. Uh, was that was that your question? Or did you want to go into deeper? Into uh, no, I, I think you you were able to address sort of a high level, but you you touched on it is sort of about the 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 valuation of our office buildings and wondering if you've heard anything of you know is, uh, is that sort of the the decreasing value of the office buildings is that constraining access to lending for developers that that could also restrict the ability to to adapt or reposition buildings. Yeah, so so and and I'll give an overarching statement of how what's driving our our policy work, which is that uh, I always want to remind people that we're not getting out of the office business in Arlington. We need a robust and growing office sector uh, and an inventory. What we're doing is looking to restructure it. And I think Jill's question was, well, how does that happen? And I think what we've seen is a significant percentage of our inventory. Um, is of an age or a quality uh, where it's kind of stuck now. Um, it it really doesn't do a great job competing for tenants. When it does, it competes at rents in terms that uh, are really um, are are cut are, are, are cut bare, um, uh, and the valuations reflect that. Two, it does those buildings and the owners don't have the access to capital at least on an asset by asset basis. To sort of reposition those in every way. Sometimes the buildings just don't work as repositioning. Sometimes the access to capital isn't there uh, because the capital markets have become very wary of investment in new office product, uh, whether it be new, whether it be, uh, and certainly in office product in general. Uh, and so, what we have are these 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 buildings in search of a solution, and we think uh, both adaptive reuse and more streamlined repositioning allows for those options that are available to owners to um, take advantage as much as possible as the market is willing to give them. Uh, and I think our tagline for CMRI was always uh, uh, regulatory solutions, uh, uh, market-based solutions for, what, what was it, Jill? What was the market-based solutions for regulatory bar barrier? What was the, what was the tagline? <laughs> I, I think it was, uh... Uh, eliminating barriers with market solutions. Yeah, short answer, we had a credit tagline, but but I think the, the point is we, we know we can't solve the capital market challenge. We know we can't um, solve uh, someone that has uh, a, a debt burden building. We can't change necessarily the nature of regional uh, uh, tenant growth and some of the trends there. What we can do, however, is uh, one, attract um, as much as possible of the tenancy in the region to Arlington, and that's a separate part of our work here at AED. But in this context, what we can do is streamline the processes so when there is a market solution, the county's process isn't in the way. 
Great, and I, th I think I, uh, there were a couple of questions that have come come in as well, Mark, and I, I think sort of based on this this discussion about financing and access and, and, and a couple of things have, have asked the question of about, you know, is there, has, has there been anything about incentives? Yes, we, we uh, and I went over very quickly at the end, but it's a great question because um, uh, a lot of other jurisdictions across the nation and North America have looked at incentives in various forms. Um, and we are certainly looking at those. I will say that the direction that we have started off on this, this year uh, and, and that will come to fruition in fall is to focus on what we do best, which is to, uh, in this case, streamline process. Uh, the, the, the county is best suited to understand its own processes and, and ways to potentially streamline those for the benefit of uh, private decision making. Um, when you get into incentives, uh, you need to do a lot more thinking about what the role of that incentive is in an overall capital uh, solution. Um, and I'll say we've done many types of projects here in the county, although not nearly as much as some, maybe some of our neighbors, including our neighbor across the river, who's been much more aggressive. But on things like Boston Corridor and others where we've been much more aggressive, those took a lot of time and thought to think about what the right role of our capital was in the investment. Um, and I can tell you the one, the first place we started is we do not want to be the, the, the lender of last resort. Uh, we don't want to be the lender that's just is the only one that will give money because that's probably a signal that uh, in that context that there needs to be more thought about whether that project can afford uh, that additional debt. And then it gets to, well, if there are gaps to fill, what is the cost benefit to the county of filling those those gaps? Um, but I think on, in a in a in a in a at a at a scale, if you think about incentives, if everyone if every project was incentivized, uh, while you can say, well, that project's producing X amount of taxes and I'm only giving back 70% of it in a classic TIF model. Um, uh, that still dramatically cuts into the amount of revenue available for services to serve the entire community, including uh, to attract people that want to work here and live here and pay those taxes. So we have we are thinking about it. Uh, we are open to ideas. Uh, we have been posed ideas from certain property owners that are looking at this um, uh, and we are we are studying them. Uh, but it's not the focus uh, first focus of this, I would say, next couple of months we will see a lot of activity of us trying trying to you know process something to get to the board that will that will make changes to our uh, to our regulatory and, and process structure. Great, thank you, Mark. Um, switching gears a little bit is is uh, maybe going to slide sixteen. You started to you know laying out some of the initial thoughts you had around timing and process, and just wondering you know. How, how you envision or or how you, you, we've been thinking from a staff perspective, but also any, any conversations of how a process can be improved to to help developers move quicker um, through the, through this. Yes, and I'll start by saying um, uh, these are not uh, these are uh, initial thoughts. Yep. Uh, we you. have we have continued to do work internally, so they're not. Uh, brainstorming are just new things that we just came up with, but they are certainly not vetted. And there's a lot of work to be done over the next several months about, about you know, next couple of months about how to actually implement potentially different types of processes. But certainly the intent is to look at a couple of things. One is that overall, if we are going to make a change, we should, the change should result in a process that's quicker and or easier than the current process, or why do it, right? So if we said, um, uh, if, 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 if we're doing nothing but resetting a conversation around something that looks a lot like a major site plan amendment, uh, we may make some gains, but the reality is it's that it's still a pretty, it's existing process that has its own, um, has its own uh, challenges associated with, with timing. Um, and so, with that said, on the table is: Do we tweak a minor? Do we a minor amendment process? Do we look administratively? Do we do we look at minor amendments for different things? And all those are about timing. Now, I think what we've heard is 
uh, that magic window of the 60 to 90 days um, is important from a due diligence standpoint, and we understand that. Uh, we also understand that that may not may may mean that a more tiered approach, which we have not done in the past, but other jurisdictions have, which is that levels of entitlement, say, an approval for change of use allows for an owner to go out and get financing uh, with confidence with their investors that the project can then be designed or further uh, spend further money on due diligence versus waiting for an entire package to be improved. So that's one thing that we're thinking about how to provide that. And we're certainly welcome to hear what moves the needle from the property owner standpoint, as well as how it affects our review process as we think about the overall, um, how we think about entitlements. Great, no, that's helpful, Mark. Uh, and, I, and I think it sort of ties into a couple of other, other questions that we've been seeing is, you know, in these conversations of, you know, time, effort, et cetera, associated with this is, is understanding the magnitude of what this might save um, you know, for developers going through and conducting adaptive reviews. Yeah, and I think and I think the first hurdle, is, as many of us know, and I mentioned this during the presentation, but just to reiterate, is I think one of the challenges we face is if you ask anyone about how long it takes to get through a process, often the answer is it depends, depending upon the site plan. Uh, it depends upon the request, the nature of the request, and what says says in the site plan. That's a hard code to crack open and sort of address. But it certainly is something that we need to at least have the conversation about because um, when we think about, well, what, what are changes to a building? Many of the things that we see that take maybe longer than, than um, our best practices in terms of adaptive reuse aren't really significant changes to the building that impact the neighbors or impact even anyone that walks by the building or sees the building or is in the building. Um, but because of a way a site plan was written, it requires a certain level of process. That's a challenge of, of it's not a one size fits all, but we're trying to get to a point where we can at least have that conversation about, do we have a at least closest, closest, closer to a one size fits all that gives some clarity about if you come to Arlington and you wanna reposition or adapt to a building, you have some sense of how long it's gonna take and what your investment window is. Great. Th thank you so much, Mark. And, you know, and I think it, it ties into to some of the other questions that have come out about um, understanding like how, how this plays into um, sort of magnitude of density changes and maybe height, uh, community benefits impact fees. So if you want to just start, again, initial thoughts uh, of, of what. Yeah, so so I think I'll take the, the last part of that first. I think we are certainly uh, going to have teed up conversations about changes in heights um, uh, as part of this policy document, but again, teeing up that conversation. And the closest that we get on the spectrum to an adaptive reuse and challenges of heights is when someone looks to adaptive reuse a project, uh, a building, and maybe adds two or three stories onto a 10 story building, not a full teardown. And that made me a first sort of example of where we look and sort of say, is there a different process around that? But I want to be clear that that is still uh, probably a little bit farther down the line in terms of uh, this year and the next, uh, and really next year into, into looking at that. Uh, but in general, we want to really focus on the ones that don't change height. Another example would be rooftops potentially could change technically height uh, if, 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 if the height was, not ex was excluded as part of say a mechanical system. But those are sort of um, those are sort of uh, very technical details on density. I think this is a more interesting part of the discussion. Um, we are definitely looking to address and promote a conversation around when someone repositions or adaptively uses a project. That often that comes with investments that refresh the building, and the refreshing of a building can be ground floor bump outs. It can mean mezzanines or terraces. It can mean using rooftop from a service space to an amenity space. Um, it also can be finding space within a building that under 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 recent under a previous approval 
was excluded, like elevator cores, but you may not need the same amount of elevator cores for a different use than the one that exists today. Um, and so finding that paper GFA uh, facade replacement or these facade improvements sometimes increase GFA uh, if the curtain wall is extending farther beyond where the existing uh, facade uh, lay. So there are a number of those things that we think we should be addressing as part of this first part of the process, which is what we're calling nominal, what we're calling nominal increases in density. Uh, and we have to define what nominal means. It's not meant to be a, a vague term that's going to live, that's just going to, we're going to say nominal. We're going to have to define that. But it's really meant to sort of say it's not changing the, the, the basic form of the building. It's really just sort of changing the, uh, uh, modernizing the building or providing sort of a significant amenity upgrade. Uh, and this is something that we've dealt with in the past where we've had very exciting projects that really aren't changing the nature of the building and doing a lot of uh, significant work on the ground floor or uh, up, the, up the scale of a building and, um, you know, are trying to find tens of thousands of square feet in a hundred thousand, couple hundred thousand square foot building. And the process is probably, I will, I will say, probably two owners for that level of of change to a building. And in this current context, uh, really would further be a challenge to investors sort of uh, making that decision to put their capital into a project like that. Uh, so we are looking at density in that form and happy to answer any more questions about that. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna ask, uh, Again, I'm trying to group these, and if you don't hear your, your question as you specifically wrote it, we're trying to pull them all together, and hopefully you're hearing uh, answers or, or at least sort of, uh, you know, initial. We will be taking all of these and pulling it together, um, again, as I had mentioned earlier. But, um, Mark, I, I think there is a question of you talked about a draft policy, and I'm just wondering about any timeline. Uh, for, for for when you hope to to have that out to the public. Yeah, so the goal right now is to, uh, we are still in the writing and internal discussion stage with then obviously uh, targeted opportunities like this and other meetings to get, uh, uh, to continue to talk about this issue. Uh, we hope to have an RTA for a policy in September. Um, as with an RTA for a policy that's not necessarily statutory, but we like to uh, give give uh, the community a, a initial heads up about a change in policy. Um, and that would have obviously elements of what that policy would look like and then give a month, uh, hopefully a month, if not uh, two, if the board so decides, but hopefully a month to uh, to change to you know tighten up that policy. I do want to say that when I use the word policy, I hope uh, I want to make sure that we're clear is we use policy a lot of different ways in Arlington. And someone will say, well, this is a policy and, it's, and you're doing it in you know, several months. It's not a land use policy like we do sector plans. It's not getting to that level of detail. A lot of this is borrowing from existing policies and practices that we already have as standards. We're not trying to rewrite everything that the county does. This is really about trying to create a a cohesive discussion around a very particular uh, problem and a very particular set of solutions for uh, for building reuse. And so the policy is not going is 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 a policy and that will be adopted by the board and provide guidance, which is incredibly important, as I mentioned in a slide of really providing that sense of urgency and 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 expectation within the community. Um, but the policy document is also not going to be what you consider, you know, the level of detail or time to needed to review as a sector plan. Um, so uh, we will see, obviously, as we go through, as people start to see versions of it, I'm sure there'll be people that will, will continue to provide comment, which we hope. Um, and we think it's doable to do that in the time. But and, and so um, we will see how we can get to that September RTA and to October board action. Thank you. I'm going to ask you, um, maybe if you could, you're try, trying to, to pull, pull a couple of different things together. Um, and it's, this might come out of like the, the question about, you know, existing conditions, existing building, but parking is a, often a controversial topic. 
um, where reviews, they, if they could be expedited, if there's separate discussion. So I'm just wondering, you know, are you considering that around parking? Yes, um, and and by we uh, certainly in in collab and in, in, in close working with our, fr our, our our colleagues in DES to help understand what those um, what those parameters are. But yes, I do think that uh, a number of things that we've learned about adaptive reuse projects elsewhere, uh, and as well as our own efforts to look at site plan amendment changes, is uh, we probably have process over function in many ways of how we look at relatively minor changes to say parking. Uh, if it says there should be 548 spaces, a change of three spaces may require an amendment, a legislative amendment. Um, um, and the question is, is that really in the spirit of the fun, you know functional change of how that building works? Particularly since a lot of our older site plans were written, uh, the condition were written and approved at a time that had different policies and different ways that we think about transportation and parking in the community. Uh, the second thing that I think has gained a lot of interest is, well, what happens when I convert and then I have all this excess parking that I truly don't need by ordinance? Um, um, and what do I do with it? And we are looking, one of the things that I didn't mention in density is we are looking at something that other jurisdictions have looked at and we've, we're looking at very hard as well, which is, uh, can you use that excess parking as some sort of GFA, whether it be storage, underground, you, you know, below grade uses, any other innovation that can happen? So we are looking at that. Uh, I'll also add loading into that. Loading is a bit more of a touchy subject because it has does have an impact on on neighbors um, when you begin to uh, sort of manage loading. But uh, and many of you that have been through the discussions on various loading discussions in the county uh, know that uh, that's a tricky subject. Uh, but certainly, as well as buildings changes, the loading docks uh, may have been built for one purpose and may have a different purpose. And we'll have to look at that about both flexibility and 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 uh, but obviously uh, and and streamlining, but also holding to standards so that those buildings function. Great, Mark. And uh, I think we've kind of answered some of this question, or you have answered some of these questions. Uh, but but looking at adaptive reuse and the question on additional costs to developers, um, you know, based on your conversations, uh, your understandings, you know, is there a true cost savings, especially when you look at, you know, there are, there are other fees associated with, with any type of redevelopment or repositioning or adaptive reuse. So true, you know, is there are true cost savings. Is the question in context of cost savings to the developer in terms of a project? Yes. 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 Yeah. I, I think I think the you know, this comes from, you know, for from it, and I think it's a case by case based in some case, but we often heard sort of, well, when you get down to it, it may cost more to it may cost as much or more to convert it or that to reuse it as it does to tear it down. Right. Um, and I think that's oversimplifying it. And I think uh, many in the region have figured out ways to really thread that needle of using buildings and using aspects of the building to create true cost savings um, and to focus the investments of the building on the re adaptive reuse um, uh, while maintaining the value. And parking is one of those. Uh, parking is one that is a big one. You can maintain the parking. Parking is a hu huge part of a significant cost. The second is, is that when you start to look at the entirety of a, a project's financial feasibility, uh, the time savings of everything from entitlements, uncertainty of entitlements, the amount of money you have to spend on an entitlement process with no guarantee you're going to get what you want. Uh, and then the speed to market once you get approvals. Adaptive reuse has a significant advantage in that you're able to see your return hurdle much quicker on the horizon than, say, a redevelopment where, um, you know, from concept to to actual opening of a, of a of a urban building in Arlington, we're, we're talking about five six years. If you know of everything from concept to going through the entitlement process to construction, it's a significant amount of lag time. And for the developer, that has comes at a significant cost. Now I'll I'll flip around to what we know even more, which is what is the cost of the county, um, uh, the speed to market 
for conversions, as I said, is a huge value proposition for us because that shows up in our tax rolls a year later. Um, we're seeing that value very quickly versus a redevelopment project. We see the entitlement value in the land. We see construction value over time, but the lagging of that value from a old building to a torn down building to a site that is going through permanent, but is now a vacant lot to a building under construction to occupancy and then to stabilization, market stabilization. It takes many, many years for that to impact our tax rolls. While I think conversion, adaptive reuse and repositionings have the ability to really shorten that timeline. Great, thank you, Mark. And, and in fact, that, that brings me to sort of a, another question that's come up. Um, and maybe it we harken back to slide six in your presentation. And, and the question is, I, you put out some, you gave information about the balance of income in 23 and expected 24, maybe even uh, FY25 from that 50-50 balance of income like that we were seeing in, in 24 between sort of our commercial and our residential and sort of what we see today. Yeah, so so I understand the question. So is the question sort of what are we seeing as projecting out? One, as we were projecting out, I think one was just to to state where we are today. Uh, I think we're I think it's a 45 percent, 55 percent. Yeah, it's about 44 percent, 56 percent, I think, commercial. And again, apartments and general commercial, as you see on this, uh, often are also included in that commercial number as well as hotel. Um, um, and apartments is really uh, obviously driving uh, a fair amount of that um, that that growth that 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 size of that pie relative to residential. And so, for those of you that aren't in the, don't know, are are when we talk about residential versus commercial, residential are um, are single family uh, dwellings, whether they be single family detached or attached, uh, condos, uh, those are our residential, uh, that's our residential tax base. And then commercial is kind of everything else, including apartments. Great, thank, thank you so much. Um, I think you know, one other is, is, I think, you know, looking at the, the stock of, of buildings that we have, uh, I'm not certain if if Arlington has, but any former residential that might have been converted to office at one point in time that could be converted back um, that that you know of. I, I think the district has seen some of that, and just wondering if if you if you're aware of anything here in Arlington. What maybe uh, buildings that convert that that converted twice? Yes. <laughs> Is that yes. What you're saying? Yes. <laughs> I'm yeah, not certain well, if we have yeah, that type of stock here in Arlington. Yeah, no, I think, and I think, I, I think, well, I think one, we don't have the history of the adaptive reuse that other places have had where that's been something. So um, it would be a pretty costly venture to, 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 to do it within a span of a year or two. Um, um, but I think uh, folks, places that have had more of a history of this certainly have seen cyclical things. And I'll just speak from a, you know, from a, from a former uh, planner, um, you know, this is sort of the, the theory behind sort of, you know, really new urbanist building, which is that buildings have, have form that shouldn't have necessary function, right? And the idea of adaptive reuse is about a building can be a bank, it can be a nightclub, it can be a, a loft apartment. Over a span of 100 years, it can be a lot of different things and still function. And I think um, we certainly are, are, we certainly, can imagine that over the long term, I think the the real financial reality is realities are if you are going through the process of say, sort of say, taking an old office building and investing it to the point of adaptive reusing as a hotel, that it's very unlikely that a year later you'd sort of say, well, that was not a good idea. Let me start over again because um, this is still a significant amount of investment to make that conversion or that that reuse happen. But we can certainly look into some examples. I know, I know, uh, we have uh, we have folks here that have looked at uh, other jurisdictions, as you know, and so we can look at examples of that as well. 
So, so great, Mark. Thanks. I think uh, you know I have I have a moment for for one other sort of comment question. Uh, we don't need to do deep dive, and I think it's it's being considered. Uh, and then we'll be wrapping it up. Uh, of really looking at sort of the, the sort of the environmental side of this, and is the role of sort of the biophilic value being considered in adaptive reuse? Yeah, so it is an active discussion, an engaging discussion, a very interesting discussion uh, with our green building team, uh, as well with our community that's very engaged in that part of the discussion um, about the value of adaptive reuse versus redevelopment, and I think. Um, from a just theoretical standpoint, we look at um, uh, there's there's obviously uh, on one side of the coin there's a sen there's the argument that an adaptive reuse uh, limits the carbon footprint of a uh, of tearing down a building and building new, which is significant, um, particularly for large urban buildings, uh, and therefore you're gaining something there. Uh, and then others will say, well, but if you're not if you're not if you're not upgrading the systems to a 2020 or 2028 standard uh, and being very aggressive, well, then that built that building while reused is not as efficient or as environmentally friendly as it should be. And I think the balance we're going to have as part of this discussion is where our adaptive reuse policy pit, fits into that construct. What we're not doing is we're not we're not intending to create a separate separate policy for conversions. More of reflect that in our current green building incentive policy, which is underway. And many of you have been briefed on in terms of where they look. They're already looking at existing buildings as a strategy, and so we're not trying to duplicate rules here. But it may require a trade-off. In some cases, an adaptive reuse project. May be viewed as more environmentally friendly or less than redevelopment. But let, one thing I want to sort of end on, which I think we should all be noted of, is that it's often not a true trade off of, of adaptive reuse versus redevelopment because uh, that someone sort of saying, well, I want to adaptively reuse it, adaptively reuse the building. And so, so you should redevelop it, and you should redevelop it and get a better project, move a street, create a park. Well, that may not be an option given the given the the where the market is or where the, that building sits relative to its market opportunity. So often the trade off is do you want a reused building or do you want a rapidly declining asset over a period of decades or years, if not decades? Uh, and that's really the trade off that we want to focus on. We think redevelopment as a motivator takes care of itself when the market's right, when the finances are right. Uh, developers will still seek that under our current plans. Um, but adaptive reuse is often what happens when that isn't a clear path forward. Great, thank you so much. Um, hopefully we, we were able to get through many questions. Uh, hopefully everybody heard the answers. Um, we've reached the end and we wanna thank you again for joining us. Um, we will be posting this webinar, the transcript, your questions and comments and, and our answers, if, if we can provide them uh, online on the county's main uh, commercial market resiliency initiative webpage. Um, it is posted at the top of the Q&A, and also if you go to www.arlingtonva.us and search Commercial Market Resiliency Initiative, you will be able to find it. So if you have any additional questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us through the online portal, through our email or contact information, and stay tuned for information about a second lunch and learn, I think that would be coming up uh, in September or so. Is that correct, Mark? Yes, we haven't uh, announced the date just yet, but we plan to do another lunch and learn with greater level of detail. Some of the questions of when the draft policy will be seen, I mentioned the RTA, we'll have a lot more detail um, in September. Um, so it'll be, it won't be a new topic, it'll be more of a uh, same topic with much more detail to react. Great, thank you so much. And thank you again all for everybody joining us today. Thank you.